Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. It's our pleasure to present you the elastic story of running Spark on Kubernetes natively at massive scale for Apple. My name is Bo Wen Li. I lead the batch processing and interactive analytics areas at the Apple AML um, data platform. My team builds and operates cloud native services like batch processing powered by Spark on Kubernetes, interactive data science service with interactive Spark and Jupyter, and interactive analytics service powered by Presto and Trino. So we serve hundreds of data engineers and scientists every day to improve our AI and ML product like Siri and Apple Search with best in class data analytics and processing infrastructure. Hui Chao is an engineering from, engineer from my team who has been focusing on how to run Spark elastically and cost efficiently on Kubernetes. So here's the agenda today. Uh, we will first talk about the benefits of cloud and our design principles to leverage those cloud native characteristics. And then the architecture of our cloud native Spark on Kubernetes platform. And why we need to like auto scale uh, our Spark service based on cost of saving and elasticity need. Then we shall um, dive deep into design of the reactive auto scaling and the productionization of it and our learnings and the future work. Sounds good. Let's get in there. So, um, you know, why we are moving to cloud um, is this might not be a new topic, but I want to iterate our unique perspectives. Um, so cloud and Kubernetes can help solve lots of the problems of legacy infrastructure have. For example, it is IGL resources are consumed on demand and the user can pay as you go. Second is elastic and scalable. We can acquire resources when need and return them when we are done. So that saves us lots of money and the compute and the um, storage are almost infinite scale. Uh, then Kubernetes enables us to build services in a container native way with strong resource isolation. So users workload only impact each other. Um, this supports our like multi-tenancy and isolation guarantees. Um, with cloud and Kubernetes, we can leverage cloud native cutting edge security techniques to build a privacy first data infra. And lastly, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes and the uh, providers of the cloud took away lots of those heavy liftings from us, which enabled our developers to focus on building and improve business critical batch processing service to achieve, you know, higher ROI. So it's a no brainer a couple of years ago for us to decide to all in cloud and Kubernetes. With the benefits of cloud and Kubernetes in mind, we set a few critical design principles for ourselves when designing the system. Uh, first, we want to fully embrace public cloud and the cloud native way of thinking and building infrastructure. That is quite a mindset, a mindset change. For example, uh, you know, in uh, the cloud native world, when we want to upgrade our infrastructure, we don't have to do any in-place upgrade, which um, expose a huge risk to our infrastructure and our users, right? In the new world, we can just spin up a completely new environment and gradually route traffic over from an old environment to the new environment and instantaneously switch back if there's an issue. So that kind of flexibility is a huge win for our DevOps. Um, second, everything should be containerized um, for elasticity, agility, and reproducibility. We aim to scale and replicate our infra very fast to cater to business needs, and full containerization enables us to do so. Third, compute and storage have to be fully decoupled so they can scale independently according to business needs. For example, the shuffle data size can vary significantly from Spark job to job, and then we have to build our own Spark service 
be able to handle that in a flexible way rather than one size fit all solution. Then security and the privacy and user experience. Uh, I'm talking about them together since they are uh, related. Um, you know, uh, in our new infrastructure, security and the privacy are first class citizens in the design and stack. And we leverage fine tuned, uh, you know, techniques like uh, roles, policies to govern our uh, data services. And at the same time, we still want to make it super easy for users to run Spark jobs uh, by following those governance. So instead of having users to run Spark submit directly, we expose a REST API that has exactly the same parameters as Spark submit. So we can enforce security at the REST API layer while still giving users a very familiar development experience. Last, we have an uh, Apple internal distribution that uh, we decided to use. Next, I wanna present our cloud native Elastic Spark architecture. So, uh, you know, we can start from the data plane. We are, in the back end, we have multiple Spark Kubernetes cluster. We use the Spark Kubernetes operator to submit to Spark jobs and manage these job life cycles. They're uh, a replica uh, set of uh, Spark operators so they can load balance and achieve high availability. Each tenant on this platform have their own resource queues powered by Apache Unicorn. Unicorn plays a few key roles here. Like it's, it, for example, uh, one is, um, it is a multi-tenancy support and resource quotas. Each queue for each tenant is fully isolated from one another. Second, Unicorn queue runs all the resource scheduling for Spark workload, you know, from basic ones like GAN scheduling requirements to more advanced scheduling policies like FIFO, um, priority or preemption. Lastly, Unicorn handles elasticity of the queues by independently scaling resources for each tenant. Uh, we have many of the Spark clusters uh, in the backend. The multi-cluster and the multi-queue strategy provide us with uh, many folds of elasticity and a linear scalability without a single bottleneck. So in the control plane, we built our own Spark service gateway, which exposed the REST API I mentioned before. Uh, it is itself is uh, container native and can be deployed and scaled very easily as a microservice on Kubernetes. When submitting a job through our REST API, users can specify additional parameters like queue name and the skate will route the job to the underlying queue. On the client side, we provide REST API, um, a simple, easy to use CLI for users to run jobs from terminal and uh, a corresponding airflow operator so users can run scheduled jobs. We have also the data science service where our data engineers quickly iterate and uh, build their Spark ETL pipeline and data scientists build and train their models interactively. We aim to share a unified backend for the two Spark services. So as you can see, our interactive Spark workload that comes from Jupyter Notebooks went through its own interactive Spark gateway and workload are running on the same infrastructure on the backend. This way we achieved the goal of reusing most of our infra without reinventing the wheel. Lastly, we closely collaborate with our security and the privacy team and uh, observability team to develop and uh, um, integrate on these two fronts in a, a, a fully integrated way. So our Spark service has been running in production for a year so far. Um, it currently supports many business critical workload for Apple AIML. Um, the development scale is massive. We are running hundreds of thousands of vCPUs 
and hundreds of terabytes of memories with supports, you know, hundreds of thousands of Spark jobs per week. The job scale is also very large. Uh, our users' biggest jobs can consume up to, you know, thousands of executors and the CPUs at the same time and it runs for hours. Uh, we have been very active contributors to the uh, Uni Apache Unicorn project and have grown committers and the PMC so organically from the team. We are also planning to open source some of the component in the stack. Um, though being um, super successful, we initially have been operating all the resources statically for users. Um, for example, our unicorn queues are of static amount of resources and we see a massive opportunity to make the stack more elastic and um, save costs. For example, workload patterns can vary from time to time in a week or even during a day, right? And, um, um, and they also vary quite a bit from use case to use case. For example, from running only scheduled jobs to mostly ad hoc and interactive jobs or mixed of both or occasionally super large scale backfill jobs. Um, when using a fixed amount of resources, it has to account for the max usage and will cause waste. So we have been investing heavily into auto scaling Spark on Kubernetes and have achieved the great results so far by cutting down cost for our users by as much as you know, 70 to 80% on queue basis. Um, next, I'll hand it over to Hui Chao to talk about how we achieved that and our learnings and roadmap on that direction. Hi folks, this is Hui Chao Zhao from AIML data platform in Apple. Now, let me walk you through the architecture and the design of this reactive auto scaling feature in our cloud native Spark cluster we delivered recently. First of all, let me talk about the auto-scaling cluster node groups layout. As a multi-tenant auto-scaling cluster, we provide physical isolation among system components, Spark driver, and uh, Spark executors. And each of them are located in their own node groups. Here, the system component, including such as node problem detector, ingress controller, Spark Kubernetes operator, Unicorn, and so on. Also, by mapping different tenant queue to their dedicated executor node groups, we can isolate different tenants from each other to minimize the potential impact and also help us to generate cost usage reports per tenant very easily. We provide a mean capacity setting per queue, so there is amount of guaranteed machine are keep running over there to support long running and smaller cadency workload. The maximum capacity setting can provide guardrail for each queue, and the workloads will be weighted in a queue if they are exceed the maximum threshold until there are related resources our scheduler finds. This is the workflow, how our cluster size being changed based on the Spark workload per node group. When users submit their job to our gateway, the SCID service will create the CRD on the corresponding cluster firstly. It will create the driver pods on driver node group to make sure the job can always be scheduled. And then executor pods will be created by Spark operator in the pre-assigned node group scheduled by Unicron. We can also see once Kubernetes cluster autoscaler find a pending pod in whichever node group, it will talk to a cloud provider to scale out the suitable numbers of nodes in the specified node group here, which is mapping to our Unicron resources queue. Vice versa, once it finds that there are idle nodes, it will terminate the node to save the cost. Besides this, 
we also provide some customized scaling control to our auto scaling clusters. For skill in control, our backend will only apply the skill in on executor node groups. And the skill in process will be triggered only when no running executor pods on the node. We have enabled bin packing provided by Unicode to minimize the number of instances to use. The default allocation policy of the scheduler will try to evenly distribute the pod to all the nodes. The bin packing policy can sort the list of nodes by the amount of available resources. So our scheduler can efficiently allocate the pod to the underutilized nodes firstly, and then to the idle nodes. So cluster autoscaler can trigger the skill in in a very efficient way. The, the right hand are EC2 machine utilization dashboard. The top one is the matrix of a static queue without being packing. We can see most of the CPU and memory utilization is only around 10 percentage. Only a few of machines can approach to 45 percentage. The bottom dashboard is shows the metrics after enabled bin packing on auto scaling cluster. We can see there is a pretty good usage rate on both the CPU and the memory compared to the massive wasting before. Regarding to the skill out control, we provide a skill out only feature to Spark driver node group, which all of our users always get their driver pods launched. So they also can check their logs over there always. We also speed up the scale out latency by tuning some Spark configurations. Now, let me talk about our production status with this new feature. Till now, we have onboarded more than 19 internal teams to our auto scaling clusters for more than three months so far. And the average cost saving range is around from 20% to 70%. During migration, we have found that all skill in events works as expected, and the machine will not be removed as long as they are running or active Spark pods. The skill out latency is consistent, which is keep lower than five minutes. Here, the maximum skill out range we are talking about is from two to 200 machines. Moreover, auto scaling feature can work with various um, type of resources usage pattern, such as ad hoc, ETL, and mixed patterns. Meantime, we also found that compared to the massive over-provisioning approach before, runtime of workloads with auto scaling enabled may increase. However, this is expected, which is due to the very good usage rate of CPU and memory compared to the massive waste before. Given this, users need to take this into consideration and optimize their jobs if there is a strict data delivery time required. I know we have covered a lot in this short time. Here are some key takeaways during we develop and deliver this new feature on our platform. Physical isolation at the min max capacity setting is a very important per customer re requirement. We can leverage node group min at the max setting and the Unicode resources quota setting together to achieve this. It will help us to support budget-based control going forward. How to provide guarantees that uh, no impact to existing Spark jobs when skill in happens is the most important feature for production jobs. We need to apply some customized skill in control based on different node group types to provide this guarantee. In time, we also need to enable pin packing to improve its efficiency. The skill out latency is important to large scale jobs. By using the dedicated driver node group and the tuned Spark configurations, we can keep the skill out latency 
as low as possible. Going forward, there are still lots of improvement areas need to be explored, such as how to support mixed instant type per cluster and how to fully support dynamic allocation. Support instance is much cheaper than on-demand instance, which we are using right now. This will be another big win if we can support it with the help of remote shuffle services or similar disaggregated com compute and storage architecture. Then we can trigger the skill in more ag aggressive and even separate the computation and the storage independently with different upscaling control. In future, how to provide a predictive autoscaling feature to the platform is another interesting topic. That's all today's sharing. Thanks for your time.